thank you for coming. Um, these are these are these are tough acts to follow. Uh, first, first they stormed Parliament. Um, then we had the amazing mashup of post-Soviet pop, and then uh, Kanye. <laughs> um, so now for something uh, much more boring. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, I was I was. Uh, this is a story of. Um, the story that I have failed to, to tell properly um, and uh, make of it what you will. I, I was born in, in the Soviet Union, 1975, in Moscow. Uh, my parents brought me over to the U.S. Uh, when I was six. And I grew up with uh, kind of two stories about the place that we had come from. Uh, one of them was that uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, it was the source of all light and culture, um, all the books in our house were Russian. Um, all the music that we listened to, um, we listened to the Soviet bards at home, Vysotsky, Galich, Akudrava. Um, when there was a Soviet movie playing at Coolidge Corner, uh, we would all get dressed up and, and go see it. Um, so that was one story. And, and the second story was it was a terrible place, and we were very lucky to have escaped from it. Um, I remember when I learned about the Stalinist uh, terror in, in high school, and I went to my dad and I said, uh, Dad, why didn't these people, you know, rebel against Stalin? It was a stupid question, uh, but my dad took it seriously, and he said, um, that's the kind of people who live in that country. Um, and I thought, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a lousy place. I, I don't want to go there. Um, and, you know, throughout my childhood, I, I basically decided uh, my parents had emigrated to America, and I should respect that, and I should become an American and, and stop being uh, Russian. Um, when I was in uh, high school senior, my mom died. My mom was kind of the connection between us and, and, and Russia. Um, and I had to really make a decision then whether I was going to, to let that connection go or, or keep it up in some way. Um, so when I got to college, I, I, just, I started taking some classes in, in Russian history and literature. And um, as a junior, I went back to Russia for the first time. Um, it was 1995. It was the craziest thing that I have ever seen. Um, some of you are too young to remember this, but some of you remember it. Um, there were guys walking around in track suits and leather jackets, uh, which I thought was a curious uh, sort of sartorial decision. Um, but then it became clear to me that they, they were wearing track suits. They were wearing leather jackets to show that they were gangsters, and they were wearing track suits so they could pick, kick people in the head. Um, my, my, my grandmother's courtyard, where I played when I was little, had turned into an open-air brothel. I don't know if you remember this uh, kind of tradition in the 90s. So uh, women would line up um, at night and men would drive into the courtyard and they would kind of scan the merchandise and invite one of the women into their car. Um, my parents had told me a story about uh, a, a place uh, uh, full of culture but uh, with an oppressive government. As far as I could tell, there was no culture and there was certainly no government. Um, and the story that I had read about Russia at this time in the mid-90s in the West was uh, that things weren't going well with the Russian reforms. And the reason that they weren't going well uh, was because the Russians were stuck in the communist past. It was pretty clear to me, and I think it would have been clear with, to, to anyone with eyes to see, that what was happening in Russia and across the post-Soviet space uh, was not communism, it was capitalism. Um, it was capitalism in its raw and kind of unfiltered form. Um, that's what I was seeing in Russia in the 90s. And I decided I, I wanted to write about this. I finished college, I became a journalist, I translated books, um, and I tried to tell Americans that their beloved capitalism was killing people in Russia. Um, and maybe it was also killing people in the United States. Um, I translated books, um, translated Lyudmila Petrushevska, whose books are about uh, the tension and, and destruction of families caused by economic anxiety. I translated Kirill Medvedev, a uh, Russian poet and essayist uh, who describes the deterioration of moral life under capitalism. 
Um, I wrote articles. Uh, none of it worked, nobody cared. <laughs> um, the interpretation of Russia in the United States um, was unmoved by anything I wrote. Um, so I decided to write a book. Um, I was undeterred. I mean, I was deterred, but, but I still decided to write a book. Um, and the book uh, was based on a year that I spent in Moscow, 2008-2009. Uh, um, I got there right after the war with Georgia. Um, and I, I was there to take care of my grandmother, who was just about to turn 90. She couldn't take care of herself. So I lived with my grandmother. Um, she had kind of mid-stage dementia, so she couldn't remember anything. So. Um, basically, uh, our lives consisted of just kind of sitting in the kitchen and having the same conversation over and over again. Um, it was a, a difficult experience while I was there. I didn't really think about writing it up. Uh, but then when I got back to New York, I kind of started writing, writing about it um, in a sort of fictional vein. And I thought, okay, here's my chance. I'm going to write this book um, about my grandmother, and then I'm going to intersperse it with these long essays in which I denounce capitalism. Um, and people will have to read it because it's in a kind of book about a grandmother. Um, so I spent, I spent five years writing this book and I remember very well uh, the day that I printed it out. It was 2015. Um, I was in the New York Public Library. I printed out my first draft. It was about 600 pages. Um, and I was very excited. And I sat down to read it. And uh, it was horrible. <laughs> it, was, uh, it could not be read by any human being, including, including me, and, and I had written it. Um, so that was a very discouraging moment. Um, and uh, my wife was pregnant with our first child. Uh, so it was also a very scary moment because I had really hoped to sell this book. Uh, I was a kind of, I had a, I had a capitalist anxiety also. Um, so I had a few weeks of being really kind of in shock and depressed, um, but there was kind of one bright, uh, aspect, uh, one bright spot to this draft, which was that the stuff about the grandmother was actually, uh, was pretty good. The grandmother was, was really funny. Um, she kept saying to the narrator, she kept saying, you know, I'm really glad you're here, but I hope you don't stay. This is a terrible country. Um, so I went back and I just cut out all those long essays in which I denounced capitalism. And I just left in the grandmother. Um, and as I was going through it, I realized actually, my grandmother's life was the best argument that you could make um, if you wanted to make an argument about capitalism and what happened in the post-Soviet state, uh, in this post-Soviet space. Um, my grandmother hated the Soviet Union. She was very happy when it fell apart. Um, and yet, in the years that followed, uh, she lost her life savings uh, to a pyramid scheme. Um, her husband, who was a nuclear physicist, lost his research institute. Um, most of all, she, she lost her sense of self, her sense of her place in the world, her understanding of how the world functioned and what things meant in it. Um, and I would walk around with her in Moscow. She still lived in the center of Moscow. Um, and she was surrounded by these incredibly expensive stores and expensive restaurants that she would never even think of going into. And she would kind of go from little grocery to little grocery to little grocery. And she knew which one had the cheapest cheese and which one had the cheapest beet salad, which she really liked, which was kind of gross. Um, but she was like this ghost. She was like this ghost in the center of Moscow. Uh, who was haunting her own life. And um, she never became a Putin supporter. In fact, uh, she had a kind of visceral repulsion uh, toward Putin. She would forget who he was, um, but whenever he would come on the TV or, um, or he, she would see his photo in a newspaper, she'd say, Kostya, who, who is this? And I would say, that's Putin. And she would say, какое, какое отвратительное лицо. <laughs> uh, what a horrible face. <laughs> what a disgusting face. Um, and uh, living with her, even though she herself uh, never supported Putin, it made me understand why people would. Um, they had experienced a really difficult time. Um, and someone came along who told them that it was going to be OK and he was going to make it better. And um, that's a powerful thing, OK? And not just in Russia. Um, I've, seen, I've seen it across the post-Soviet space, and it's not always someone like Putin. Uh, 
Um, and it may have a different content. It may have a, a very nationalist content. Um, but it's a similar effect. And people will follow that person even when it turns out that they've been lied to. Um, so that's the book I ended up publishing, uh, A Terrible Country. Um, and uh, I wish I could say that how, after I published it, people, uh, people realized the truth um, and changed their minds. Uh, they didn't, they did not. Um, I published it into the teeth of the Trump-Russia story, uh, which on the one hand was a nice thing for my book because people cared about Russia in a way that they hadn't in many, many years. Um, but uh, they cared about Russia in a particular way. Uh, they wanted to know uh, about how, how evil Russia was and how Russia had destroyed our democracy. And I was certainly very mad at the Russians for hacking um, the Democratic National Committee. Uh, I was very mad at them for helping to elect um, uh, a horrible person uh, to be our president. Um, but I was more mad at the tens of millions of Americans who had voted for him. Um, I was more mad at the Democratic Party, which had put forth a, a, a very uninspiring candidate. Um, I really thought the sources of our American problems were in America. And that's what I said, and um, people didn't necessarily uh, care to hear it. Um, so I stand before you as a kind of failed storyteller. Um, I, I don't even know how I got invited <laughs> to this <laughs> festival. Um, but thank you, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I do have this belief that uh, I, this kind of one, my one bit of magical thinking is that a novel, uh, if you kind of encase your, your ideas in a story that people might continue to read, um, you know, it might not happen right away, but it might happen eventually. Um, and, I, and I still believe that. So um, that's where I am. Thank you for listening. Thank you.